Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. And welcome to another of our weekly webinars on China. We have, as usual, a fantastic speaker. But before I introduce the speaker and the subject, let me just remind you that uh, if you are new to our events, that you will be able to take part in the discussion through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And if you are using the Facebook feed, you will also be able to raise questions and the questions will be related to me. When you raise the questions, if you would like to keep your anonymity, please just say so, and I will not read out your name or your specific affiliation. But when you raise the questions, it would be very helpful to me if you would say who you are, whether you are, a, for example, a student at SOAS or somewhere else, or you are a researcher, at a different location, it will simply give me a better scope to uh, bring in more questions from a range of people as I move forward in selecting the questions for the speaker. And the speaker is Professor Jessica Chan Weiss, and she is a very distinguished colleague in the um, political science of, at Cornell University. She's also the political science editor at the Washington Post Monkey Cage Block and a non-resident senior associate at CSIS in the United States. Jessica received her PhD from the University of California, San Diego and has and had taught at Yale University before she relocated and settled at the Cornell University in upstate New York. She has published in many leading journals and is the author of Powerful Patriots, Nationalist Protest in China's Foreign Relations, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2014. And the subject of her presentation today is a world safe for autocracy, question mark, the domestic politics of China's foreign policy, a subject that, if I may say so, is very close to my heart indeed. Over to you, Jessica. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve, for that very kind introduction, and thank you all to being for being here. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. I wish I could be with you in person, um, but it's uh, wonderful to to see folks from near and afar. So, I'd like to talk today about my new book project on the domestic politics of Chinese foreign policy. It, there are, you know, pressing questions I think we face about what China wants and what will China's rise mean for the future of the international order. And I'd like to present to you today a framework that I've developed uh, in conjunction with a colleague, Jeremy Wallace, uh, which is grounded in the domestic politics of authoritarian rule in China and its implications for how China approaches the international order and various different foreign policy domains. Uh, a version of this uh, framework and its illustrations will be coming out in a new issue of international organization uh, later this year. And the broader book project is uh, under contract with Oxford University Press. So I very much look forward to your questions as I'm continuing to develop the manuscript. Of course, uh, in keeping with some of my previous work, I'll talk today a little bit about how China has managed nationalism uh, in its foreign policy and what is this meant for understanding the frequent disconnect between Chinese rhetoric and Chinese behavior. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts about uh, what might lie ahead for US-China relations and the international order uh, more broadly, as well as some policy uh, implications. So first, what does China's rise mean uh, for world politics? An increasingly prevalent view holds that the United States and China are on the precipice of a new 
Cold War, or perhaps are already in a new Cold War. And in this view, uh, China is a revisionist that seeks to overturn uh, US hegemony and the existing international order defined as the institutions, norms, uh, and practices that shape uh, international relations and global governance. Others have been more optimistic that China could still be peacefully integrated into the system. And proponents of this view have argued that the US led order, even as US hegemony fades, has been open enough uh, to accommodate China's rise peacefully and uh, China has incentives to remain within and contribute uh, to that system, um, whether rationally or by a process of, of socialization over time. And a related argument uh, has been that the chief problem in China's rise has been uh, for free riding, that China has not contributed enough. And so in this view, you know, the policies uh, of the past four decades of engagement have worked. Um, proponents of this view note that there has been no war uh, in Asia. Uh, can you imagine the counterfactual since the end of World War II? And particularly, uh, you know, China has not used force uh, since uh, its war with Vietnam. Yet still, uh, in recent years, we have seen far greater variation that I think is missing from these uh, sort of canonical uh, views of, of China's uh, approach to the international system. Overall, of course, China's authoritarian character is at odds with key aspects of the existing order, particularly uh, the emphasis on individual rights, on universal values, and on rules-based multilateralism. At the same time, China has profited immensely from its participation in the international order and remains in some ways a staunch defender of the Westphalian uh, order on which it was built, and particularly the UN Charter. And at times, uh, you know, we've seen in the past few years, ironically, China seeming even perhaps more committed to preserving aspects of the existing order than uh, the United States under the Trump administration. Hence the irony of, of Xi Jinping appearing to defend globalization and free trade at Davos or cooperation on the coronavirus at the World Health uh, Assembly. Now, some of this variation, um, both in China's behavior and in the US approach to the international order has been uh, documented in an important uh, recent article by Ian Johnston, where he shows that you know, far from China being you know, clearly the revisionist uh, power, there's actually a lot of variation in how China interacts with different aspects of the international order, um, supportive of some, unsupportive of others, and partially supportive of still others. And he presents a descriptive analysis uh, of this variation in a recent article. And what isn't, I think, fully captured in this uh, first is an explanation for this variation, uh, as well as China's evolving uh, behavior uh, and approach to different issues, both in terms of its rhetoric, as well as in the terms of its behavior. And that far from a Beijing consensus that some have put forward underneath you know, Xi Jinping's grand slogans of a China dream or shared future for uh, humankind, there's significant issue by issue variation. It has been a conservative defender of some issues like uh, the UN Charter and has opposed others like the United States, uh, the International Criminal Court. And of course, it has rejected the standing of the International Court of Arbitration on the South China Sea. And yet in one of the most important areas of global governance, climate change, we've seen an abrupt reversal from being an obstructionist uh, and laggard power to one that's playing a much more uh, leadership role in this space in just a few years. So how do we account for this variation? So I present a new theoretical uh, framework to explain this variation both across space and over time. And the starting premise of this uh, domestic politics based argument is that the Chinese Communist Party is of course for first and foremost a concern with its domestic survival with Xi Jinping at the helm. This is not uh, China's only ambition, it's not the CCP's only ambition, but it's certainly the most important they can't achieve very much else if not in power. And uh, for decades, the CCP has been deathly afraid of peaceful evolution and democratic contagion. After all, most communist states around the world have collapsed and the CCP is very afraid of going the way of these others. So its overarching uh, goal is regime survival, uh, a world safe for autocracy as I've written uh, in foreign affairs. Now, survival is more than just repression. It's also about performance. It's about persuasion and it's about co-optation, providing 
uh, not only uh, bread, but also circuses, if you will, to bolster its domestic support. And so my theory identifies two different characteristics, centrality and contestation, or heterogeneity, as I've written in uh, international organization, that really shape the domestic politics of a given foreign policy issue. And it's variation along these two dimensions that shapes China's interests and its investments, both domestically and uh, internationally. And it's important to note that these are all malleable. These are not exogenously given, but rather are shaped and contested both by the state and by various interests and actors uh, inside society. So what are these two different uh, concepts? Centrality first describes how closely an authoritarian government like China sees an issue as affecting its survival prospects, and in particular, the core pillars of its legitimation strategy. Since the late 1970s, the CCP has relied on a combination of nationalism, economic performance, and stability to justify its continued single party rule. First, nationalism, securing the defense and territorial integrity of the nation has been critical to the CCP's justification of its continued rule, not just at the founding of the PRC when Mao declared that ours will no longer be a nation subject to insult and humiliation, we have stood up, but it's been a continual theme throughout uh, the CCP's rule, even in the, in the reform era. And as particular as the last uh, two Chinese regimes were ousted by nationalist movements, as Susan Shirk has noted, uh, CCP leaders are especially concerned about defending the nation's sovereignty against perceived foreign encroachment, as well as returning China to the status and privileges of a great power. The second pillar, economic growth. In particular, the CCP has relied upon rapid economic growth and a litany of economic statistics, GDP in particular, to claim its competence and to justify its rule in the post-Mao era. So under Deng Xiaoping and, 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 and subsequent leaders, the CCP moved away from communist ideology as a barometer of good performance, instead touting slogans like, to get rich is glorious, or black or white, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. And the third pillar is public security or stability. And the ability to keep the CCP, uh, the, the Chinese citizenry safe from whether it's disease, disaster or crime or the fear of chaos. Um, this has been a central pillar of the CCP's continued uh, claim to rule. And we can see that in the CCP's propaganda, uh, you know, drawing attention to the so-called chaos that it sees uh, in democratically ruled uh, societies around the globe, make, making China's uh, relatively stable domestic governance in their view, uh, relatively more appealing. So what does this then mean for the Chinese government's foreign policy performance? So looking here, we see a lot of variation in whether an issue is domestically central uh, or less central. And so the more central a foreign policy issue is to the government's domestic legitimacy, the much harder it is for the CCP to concede without suffering a potentially destabilizing domestic backlash. And the more likely it is to pursue unilateral policies, uh, regardless of the international costs. So this is, of course, typically applies to what China has defined, or the CCP has defined as China's core interests, issues like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, and in Xinjiang territorial disputes. On these issues, China has been, the Chinese government has been hyperactive uh, in making demands, uh, insisting on its preferences, even uh, when these have led to international censure as we saw uh, in the South China Sea, for example, when it rejected uh, the ruling or the standing of the International Tribunal. Uh, and international pressure in general uh, that has aimed at the central pillars um, or those that seek to uh, you know, change the regime itself uh, have been especially likely to backfire, um, heightening the CCP's sense of domestic insecurity as well as rallying domestic audiences around the CCP's leadership. But a lot of different international issues like most before the United Nations do not uh, impinge directly on the central uh, pillars of the CCP's uh, legitimacy. And so on these issues, uh, whether it's the uh, you know, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, or the, you know, the IMF, the Chinese uh, government has been much more flexible about its approach, uh, for example, as moving closer to uh, international practices, uh, including the announcement of a debt sustainability framework in response to criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, or rhetoric about uh, you know, the environmental and social uh, practices uh, that have accompanied its infrastructural investments. 
So the a key uh, implication of this idea of centrality is that the greater um, the domestic centrality of an issue, the more likely the government in China is to rely on performance rather than repression because domestically repression is, is costlier as well as more likely to backfire. It's not that the government can't repress, as I found in my first book, the Chinese government prevented anti-American demonstrations after a US reconnaissance plane and a Chinese fighter jet uh, collided uh, over the South China Sea. The Chinese government prevented anti-American protests from taking place, but they still relied on this sort of symbolic performance of uh, commemorating and celebrating the, mar the so-called martyred uh, Chinese uh, pilot who disappeared uh, into the sea. And in addition, international pressure that appears sort of aimed at one of these issues that could undermine the CCP's legitimacy is more likely to backfire by uh, rallying Chinese audiences around the regime as well as provoking a greater resolve to stand firm. So for example, uh, you know, greater international pressure on the issue say of Taiwan could backfire if it in turn increases a domestic Chinese resolve to take a tough stance that it would not have otherwise, or to take uh, you know, quick action um, rather than uh, defer the action, defer the issue uh, for, for years to come. Now, in turn, if you're thinking about this in terms of the international relations theory, this then, uh, the domestic centrality of an issue then affects the government's uh, bargaining position at the international level in the spirit of a two-level game. So. A, this means that on central issues, on issues that the Chinese government is willing to go alone, go it alone and, and pay large, potentially large costs, they're more likely to have leverage than in the international space uh, to you know, demand uh, international reforms on that issue or to go outside to build a like-minded coalition of states uh, to advance China's issue, interests in an alternative uh, set of institutions. And so ultimately, whether or not uh, you know, these investments um, by the Chinese have entailed greater cooperation or conflict with uh, other states in the international order depends on, of course, the prevailing norms and practices, as well as the willingness of other stakeholders uh, to make concessions to uh, China's domestic uh, imperatives. So as uh, Scott Kastner, Margaret Pearson, and Chad Rector put it in our, their recent book, a rising power's outside options and their indispensability will jointly determine uh, whether or not the rising power will invest in, demand changes to, or passively accept a particular uh, set of uh, norms and practices in global governance. So what we have here with centrality is helping to determine where it is it that China will have these outside options. And then in turn, how does that then affect China's uh, leverage or negotiating power within the system? Now it's important to note that these central pillars, nationalism, growth, and public security are often in tension with one another. And it's managing these domestic pressures and if you will, contradictions uh, that the Chinese government faces a number of risks and trade-offs. And so it means that an issue on which, you know, the Chinese government, um, you know, places central importance doesn't necessarily mean that the Chinese government is unable to make concessions. It just requires that there be an equally central alternative um, pillar that is uh, counseling uh, cooperation. So for example, uh, Taylor Fravel in his uh, first book shows that the Chinese Communist Party has been willing to make territorial compromises with neighboring states when it was uh, interested in shoring up its domestic security and control over uh, minority populations uh, along the border. Similarly, uh, China's changing stance uh, on climate uh, is another example of an issue that touches on two different uh, domestic pillars, economic growth, but also uh, public stability as concerns about air pollution uh, mounted in, and became a crisis uh, in Chai China. Initially, the Chinese government viewed international efforts to limit carbon emissions as threatening domestic economic growth and China acted as a spoiler uh, at Copenhagen. But once the scale of the catastrophe became domestically uh, known and, and galvanized both mass as well as elite outrage, the Chinese government shifted strategies, uh, investing uh, and taking a leadership role in international efforts to limit carbon emissions. And so here it was that public health and stability came to the fore, uh, as Xi Jinping explicitly noted in stating that, you know, if environmental problems uh, are not handled well, 
uh, they most often easily incite, quote, mass incidents, the, the Chinese uh, government's term for um, popular protest. So in international crises, the government often faces a trade-off. Similarly, in managing nationalist mobilization, um, or like the protests that I have uh, researched myself, sometimes the Chinese government benefits by allowing these grassroots protests, whether it's on the streets or online, to help the government show resolve and demonstrate that China won't be pushed around to international audiences. But these nationalist mobilizations also come at a cost to domestic stability. And so this is a dilemma that, uh, as I argued in Powerful Patriots, that the international context um, can help adjudicate affecting the government's calculus in which direction, uh, which pillar it, it leans on nationalism or, or on domestic stability. But the Chinese government is not monolithic. China is not monolithic. And so this second factor, contestation, describes the degree of domestic division or heterogeneity at both the mass and elite level, often rooted in geographic, economic, institutional, as well as ideological differences. Because even in an authoritarian system like China's, power is fragmented and contested. Central and local leaders face different incentives, different levels of information. And oftentimes central decisions and slogans need to be interpreted and implemented by multiple levels and agents of the state. And often we find you know, powerful industries and um, businesses are far from faithful agents uh, of the state, even if uh, ultimately uh, they are subject to uh, the government's um, you know, predation as well as uh, ultimately uh, control or, or reigning in their activities. And so the more contested an international issue is domestically, the more likely we are to see difficulties uh, with implementation and enforcement of China's international commitments. So take the example again of, of climate. Local officials in China have often resisted central directives to shut down polluting firms um, as economic development has remained of primary significance in cadre's uh, promotion evaluations. And Chinese officials and industries have also become quite adept at gaming the system, uh, providing as if compliance uh, with environmental regulations and incentives. And so when state leaders uh, set out a general direction but leave many of the specifics to be hashed out, concentrated domestic interests uh, can often dominate both the design as well as the implementation uh, of various policies. So for example, uh, recent research on the Belt and Road Initiative uh, suggests, and as Yun Yun Ang put it, that his Belt and Road Initiative has really provided an encompassing but vague slogan that has made it easy for domestic interest groups to use a national policy uh, as cover to pursue their own agenda. So let's put these two together. What do centrality and contestation uh, get us? Well, first of all, they don't map neatly onto one another. Some highly central issues are also uh, highly contested. Many issues, in fact, ranging from climate trade, uh, climate change to trade, exchange rates, internet governance. These are all issues on which there are winners and losers of any particular policy and oftentimes a lot of domestic uh, agitation uh, over what policy uh, ought to look like. But other highly central issues like Taiwan are not characterized by a great deal of contestation. And this of course is in part a feature of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda efforts as well as their um, you know, willingness to kind of patrol the boundaries of, of domestic discourse and debate. And looking now to the, the bottom um, portion of this table, of course, some issues are remain, you know, sort of characterized by low centrality, not particularly, um, you know, pertinent to the Chinese government's um, domestic uh, legitimacy, such as, you know, most issues before the United Nations. But some of these issues nonetheless implicate a number of different domestic interests that are characterized by a higher degree of contestation. So for example, the Iran nuclear deal um, Ian Johnston uh, notes that China played an important role in the Iran nuclear deal, for example, helping to design uh, a key reactor to reduce uh, Iran's future plutonium output. But at the same time, China also failed to halt the export of particular uh, missile technologies um, due to um, the well-connected interests of a particular uh, arms exporter. 
Now, one thing that's missing from any kind of static table like this is the significant movement uh, as domestic actors try to manipulate uh, the apparent centrality of a particular issue. So for example, subnational actors and industries may try to link their demands to a central pillar of the CCP's domestic legitimacy in order to increase the likelihood of what you might call side payments uh, or loopholes that protect them from international commitments. So in a bidding war for central government attention, subnational actors that are able successfully to sort of magnify the centrality of their interests uh, are then more likely to succeed than those whose uh, you know, demands are still seen as relatively peripheral uh, or parochial. So I, I, here I draw upon the work of Margaret Pearson who you know, argued that you know, during China's uh, negotiations over admission to an accession to the WTO, an array of different industries and ministries as well as provincial governments lobbied for continued protection um, and some were more successful than others. So the telecommunications industry, for example, and its affiliated ministry, the Ministry of Information Industries, succeeded by linking their demands to the national interest. As Margaret Pearson notes, they claimed that foreign internet providers uh, would use access to China's internet markets to steal economic information, disseminate propaganda, and use the internet to support dissidents or undermine the party. And these arguments tapped into deep worries about loss of Chinese sovereignty, and widespread fear of social unrest made such arguments especially potent. So here we can see an example of how it is that subnational actors try to and sort of magnify uh, the centrality of their demands in order to get particularistic uh, accommodations or protections. But we also see the Chinese government playing a significant role in molding or shaping the apparent centrality as well as the you know, degree of domestic contestation over a particular issue. So for example, um, the Chinese government framed resistance in Hong Kong and the US-China trade war as part of a national struggle reminiscent of the Opium War, the Korean War, and other historical disputes in which China uh, eventually prevailed. And so in doing so, the Chinese government did a couple of things. One, it, it, it sought to uh, you know, build public support for the costs of a protracted dispute. It sought to raise the domestic cost of international concessions, and it tried to signal its stand, intent to stand firm uh, against foreign pressure, increasing the centrality, but also uh, diminishing the kind of space for uh, contestation over this issue. Right, rather than making this an issue about the winners and losers of a trade war, this was now uh, about a national struggle uh, against uh, foreign pressure uh, to keep China down. And preliminary uh, sort of initial evidence um, from surveys conducted by uh, scholars Wei Yishir and Zhu Liang find that indeed these uh, framing efforts have been effective. So that survey respondents when asked uh, about the ongoing uh, trade war were much more supportive of the government's response when it was framed as part of a geopolitical struggle with the United States rather than when its economic costs uh, were mentioned. Now I wanna talk about the issues in the upper left quadrant. Um, these high centrality, low contestation issues that mostly I think encapsulate China's so-called uh, core interests. And a key question here is the role of nationalism. Because if there is, as I've just noted, a lot of malleability and movement in how different issues are constructed across time and space, how constrained really is the Chinese government um, by the nationalist sentiments that it has nurtured? And so the argument here that I make is that nationalism is a malleable constraint. It's not a direct driver in Chinese decision-making. So I first wanna talk about why it is uh, that nationalism is malleable. First, it's malleable because it's not an exogenous, wholly independent force. It's, um, I'm a, I like to garden when it's not quite so snowy outside. So I'll use a, a metaphor of, of landscaping. It's both cultivated and selectively pruned back by the state and its agents, whether that's through history textbooks, patriotic propaganda, or the media. And over time, the gardener can cultivate, can renovate, or even extend the landscape. But this is hard work once, especially, a particular strand of nationalism has grown extensive roots in society and become established. But it's important to note that the government isn't the only one involved in nationalist myth-making. 
of course, there are many actors and individuals in civil society, uh, fervent believers, um, but nonetheless, the Chinese government still steers the bounds of domestic discourse to align with its domestic international objectives. And so this nationalist storytelling affects what uh, you know, historian Rana Mitter calls the circuits of memory, which historical episodes are showcased for domestic consumption, which contemporary external disputes are highlighted as critical and defined as part of the nation's core interests. So if nationalism is malleable or endogenous to the Chinese government's own uh, domestic propaganda and foreign policy strategies, is it how constraining is it really? Here, I argue it's a constraining factor because nationalism provides contingent support. So it's one of the chief pillars of the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy, and as such, it can bolster or also threaten regime security if toppled. And in particular, weak performance on issues that have been defined as central to the defense and advancement of the nation's interests can ultimately hollow out, chip away, or topple the CCP's claim to rule. So in this way, nationalism shapes the government's calculus, but doesn't really directly tie its hands. So in particular, nationalism defines which foreign policy issues are central and which are peripheral to the government's domestic legitimacy. So it shapes the domestic costs the government faces in navigating a real or hypothetical crisis or foreign policy challenge. And in particular, mobilized nationalism, whether it's online or in the streets, tends to increase the costs of compromise and it shapes the domestic decision-making environment. Again, on the margins, it's not a direct driver, but it shapes the government's foreign policy calculus. And then it also affects what issues the government is able to credibly invoke the specter of popular mobilization, whether that's street protests or consumer boycotts to signal to international audiences. And increasingly in an interconnected age, despite censorship, popular nationalism often provides the initial spark for international confrontation as Chinese netizens go global in their uh, efforts to defend China as uh, the NBA controversy uh, showed. And even if nationalism doesn't play a direct role, the government's expectations of where it is likely to face popular criticism uh, will shape the government's calculus as it considers the risks and potential rewards that it stands to gain uh, in taking particular uh, decisions. And so nationalist narratives begin to you know, provide that rhetorical framework that shapes you know, which foreign policy critiques become powerful, which ones are, you know, only a glancing uh, interest. So it affects the latent sensitivity of the government across different issue areas. So in survey work that I've done, I find that Chinese attitudes are generally hawkish. A majority of respondents have endorsed uh, greater reliance on military strength, um, supported greater spending on national defense, um, uh, others, Andrew Chubb, find you know, there's very strong approval of sending troops to reclaim disputed islands in the East and South China Sea, as well as viewing the US military presence uh, in Asia as threatening. Interestingly, uh, hawkish views were more common amongst younger Chinese um, respondents that were reached um, by a set of uh, surveys done um, out of uh, Beijing, but ac across the, the country. Uh, in 2015. And Chinese elites uh, were also more hawkish than their uh, sort of mass public counterparts, as well as netizens um, that I surveyed. So, you know, there are, of course, always questions about, you know, how reliable uh, are the uh, survey responses in China. Nonetheless, what I think, and, you know, of course, what Chinese citizens are willing to say, whether that's in a survey or online, is an important part of the kind of mobilized um, public opinion, um, the attentive public, if you will, that the Chinese government uh, has to deal with. Of course, what Chinese um, people really think is also very important, but what they're willing to say then becomes you know, part of the political calculus. So then the what question, a, a particularly important question is, in a particular dispute, how and to what extent can the Chinese government untie its hands or uh, navigate flexibly, even as uh, you know the public might be upset. Well, here, I think national sentiments do affect you know how successfully the Chinese government can appeal for restraint, uh, as well as how the government might behave when it cannot. And so, a colleague and I found, um, using a variety of survey experiments, uh, evidence of what political scientists call audience costs, where 
uh, respondents disapproved more after China made a threat in a dis dispute but then backed down than if the government didn't make the threat in the first place. And respondents in our surveys cited national honor as one of their main concerns in criticizing uh, the government's uh, inaction. And similarly, uh, you know, research by Ian Johnston and Kai Kwek find that you know, appeals to the costs of war, China's peaceful identity, and the, even the offer of UN mediation have been shown to increase public approval uh, of restraint. Still, as I noted, um, you know, China has not gone to war since 1979, so there must be other tactics that the government has been able to use to manage these public opinion costs. And so here I've just um, put up a screenshot of a recent paper uh, that I published with Alan Defoe in International Studies Quarterly, where we point to the possibility of bluster, symbolic military moves and rhetorical statements that are tough but vague, uh, vague enough uh, to escape this kind of binding uh, constraint uh, imposed by audiences who are upset about you know, apparent inconsistency in the government's failure to follow through. And so, you know, this is, uh, you know, one tactic that can be used, but there are still, I think, limits to how much the government can manage these domestic costs of restraint. So in a, you know, a follow-up study, we looked at the real-time effect of U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea to pick up the effect of all this Chinese bluster, but the actual effect of these real-time patrols. And we found an increase um, in Chinese public disapproval, suggesting that the government does face pressure in, in such an instance uh, to, um, to, to behave and respond uh, rather than exercise restraint at the moment. So even though the Chinese government largely exercised a military restraint, it did so at some domestic cost, suggesting that over the long term, these kinds of actions can provoke uh, greater resolve amongst the Chinese public uh, to, to do more uh, in the future. So I realize that we're, we're drawing close to the end of our, our time together. So I want to um, wrap up here uh, with some conclusions for um, both uh, you know, China in the international order, uh, as well as some policy implications. So first, you know, the takeaway here is that the Chinese government has really behaved strategically with the domestic politics of its approach to various issue areas determined ultimately uh, by the politics of uh, its domestic rule. And so if China is simultaneously a revisionist in some areas, a reformer, a free rider, and even a defender of the status quo in other areas, perhaps a better term to use is one of disgruntled stakeholder uh, to describe a rising China. And so what I've argued here is that the CCP has ultimately sought first to secure its survival and its legitimacy, a world that is safe for autocracy, but also one that isn't necessarily at odds with a world safe for democracy. Now, increasingly, you know, China's you know, efforts to create a world safe for autocracy is having uh, international uh, spillover effects. And as criticism of the CCP and hopes for regime change have grown abroad, uh, so has the CCP's willingness to uh, show off its resolve and proclaim a superior system. And so an open question is whether the CCP leadership newly uh, both frightened by the early days of the coronavirus, but emboldened by its relative um, success in combating COVID-19, will it more actively try to tip the scales around the world um, away from democracy and toward Chinese style autocracy? Now to date, China's behavior in this area has largely been pragmatic and it's been agnostic about the regime type of the host countries that it has worked with. The strings that China attaches to its you know, aid and investments have really been to the one China principle, not to how autocratic or democratic the other government is. And its economic coercion, whether that's boycotts or sanctions has really been targeted at companies and governments that have you know, supported causes that the CCP deems threatening to its core interests, not necessarily, you know, overall this sort of ideological democracy versus autocracy question. And so to me, this continues to look more heavily weighted toward nationalist rail politique on Beijing's part rather than a universalizing ideological mission. Um, and of course this could change. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that an overly ideological approach on the part of whether it's the United States or it's liberal democracies in Europe is that the more ideological the approach taken toward China, the more likely it will inflame Chinese 
uh, regime insecurities and perhaps um, you know, encourage the CCP to play an even more uh, offensive strategy uh, in trying to defend itself at home. Now, in terms of the international implications for policy, I think the framework here suggests that different kinds of international pressure are more or less likely to succeed. The more central uh, an issue is, the more likely it is to backfire unless a countervailing uh, the equally central incentive for the Chinese government to shift policy uh, can be found. The more contestation there is domestically on some of these central issues, the more international audience or international policymakers may be able to identify a domestically powerful constituency that can um, be played off of another and, and in particular uh, allowing certain constituencies to be bought off uh, with, with side payments. And this is how it was that the Chinese government, after facing a lot of international pressure, um, you know, several years ago on the value of the RMB was able to overcome a bit of opposition from uh, entrenched interests and industries. And that's particularly important in the context of a lot of domestic contestation to recognize that Chinese rhetoric, not just material, not just material policies, but also symbolic rhetoric often plays to uh, multiple audiences uh, rather than always being uh, consistent um, or predictive of Chinese behavior. Now, finally, ultimately, this kind of a strategy is not about getting China to do something that is not in its interest, but rather to do something that is in the interests of some powerful constituencies uh, while minimizing the opposition of others. Now, of course, this kind of a strategy will only work uh, when there is a relatively strong domestic constituency that is aligned with uh, external interests. On some other issues, like, for example, cyber governance, uh, you know, Molly Roberts shows in her research that censorship acts like a regressive tax. So elites have the means to circumvent the Great Firewall while less wealthy or less educated citizens don't. They, up to half of the internet population isn't even aware of the Great Firewall's existence. So in such a case where the powerful aren't suffering and the less powerful have little ability to mobilize to demand change, that's not an issue on which you're likely to be able uh, to use these domestic divisions uh, to galvanize um, kind of an alignment for reform. So taking stock ultimately, you know, what does this mean for the future of international order? We're likely to see the most friction on highly central, low contestation issues. But it's important to note that China's you know, domestic social purpose uh, doesn't require the wholesale destruction of the existing inter Jessica, we have lost your voice. Um, Jessica, we are not hearing you. International order. Oh, not working? Yeah, you're you're was... back. You were frozen earlier. Uh, I was frozen earlier, but okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. And no. you were talking about the implications that chi domestic Chinese policy don't require is to be yes. really aggressive externally. So it doesn't require the wholesale destruction of the existing international order, but I do think it favors a more conservative version that emphasizes Westphalian norms of, of sovereignty and non-interference. So, you know, within the United Nations, China has sought to alter international obligations on human rights to emphasize the primacy of state sovereignty. Um, oversight of civil society and, and development above all. But there are many areas, for example, the national security law for Hong Kong uh, and the intimidation of overseas Chinese where we see uh, you know, Chinese actions threatening the principle of non-interference. So if China wants to return uh, to defending a more Westphalian system of mutual coexistence amongst sovereign states, it will need to curtail uh, these extrusions of what we might call sharp power uh, into other societies. But ultimately, I think the more that the Chinese Communist Party relies upon this sort of more chauvinistic form of nationalism, the less successful it will ultimately be in its efforts to claim global leadership and attract international support. And already its efforts to proclaim superiority in combating the coronavirus have fueled you know, a lot of suspicion and alarm. Now, of course, I think that other countries are also uh, you know, 
at risk of pursuing an equally nationalistic strategy. And so in, uh, in an op-ed in the New York Times, I you know, warned against uh, the United States trying to quote, out China, China. Uh, and then in particular, a strategy really based on tit for tat reciprocity risks ceding the initiative to Beijing and ultimately risking a race to the bottom, sacrificing the very kind of openness and liberalism uh, that US policy has aimed to protect. So um, with that, I think uh, I'll conclude and um, really appreciate your attention and look forward to all the many questions I see coming in. Well, thank you very much, Jessica, for your very, very thoughtful and indeed thought-provoking presentation. Uh, it's a tribute to you that we already have 19 questions in the Q&A box, and I will try to go through as many of them as I can. <clears throat> but as usual, before I go to the question from the Q&A box, can I start off by asking you to focus in particular in the Xi Jinping era, particularly after Xi Jinping became the dominant leader in China at the 19th Party Congress of 2017. Because in your presentation, you talk about contestations and that there were significant uh, disagreements with, on certain uh, policy matters within the Chinese government. My question to you is, while that will apply if we look at the reform period generally, but if we only look at the period since the 19th Party Congress, when Xi Jinping becomes the dominant leader in China, what are the areas of contestations that we still see under Xi Jinping and who are the leaders within the Chinese leadership who contested on those specific foreign policy issues against the express wishes and policy guidelines of Xi Jinping? Mm. Thanks, it's an excellent question. And in some cases, in some ways, the sort of the more recent we get, the harder it is to detect this internal contestation. And I don't mean to say that there are, uh, you know, established, you know, factions that are driving policy. Uh, far from it. I think that, you know, under Xi Jinping, we've seen a real effort to root out and crack down on any potential sources of, uh, you know, real challenge. Nonetheless, I think that that desire to preempt or respond to and diffuse any particular uh, threats to Xi Jinping's authority does have a policy component. It's not just about eliminating people, but it's also about getting ahead of uh, and preventing um, potential sources of uh, consternation or concern. And so we saw, I think, some of this uh, take place in, in the, at the early phase of, of China's uh, you know, so-called war against the coronavirus. And we saw uh, calls for greater freedom of speech. Uh, we saw, you know, certain elites, uh, you know, Rinju Chiang, all the way to in intellectuals like uh, Xu Jiang and Xu Zhangren, uh, you know, criticize uh, in very harsh terms uh, the performance of the CCP, and particularly the kind of the silencing, the early silencing of of local uh, doctors and, and others. Um, and so that is an example of even though there is, of course, a great effort to instill kind of ideological, you know, unity and uh, you know deference uh, to the top party leadership and Xi Jinping in particular, there still exists, uh, you know, a, a great divergence of views. Now that's not a particularly a foreign policy issue. You know, I think on the issue of say, you know, Taiwan, for example, um, you know, there are still within, you know, nobody is contesting, you know, in China whether or not. Taiwan is part of China. That is not within the bounds of discourse. But the question of, you know, how quickly should the mainland move to achieve, you know, the shared goal of, of so-called reunification, that is an issue on which there is disagreement. What is this a, a you know, a time at which conditions are ripe uh, for, you know, reunification to proceed more quickly? Or is, you know, China simply still, you know, not strong enough militarily and to do so in a way that would be consistent with Chinese interests. And so you saw even here, you know, briefly, uh, you know, some conversations, um, public comments, uh, you know, by military or military affiliated figures uh, discussing how 
China should think about, you know, this objective of, of reunification in particular, whether or not to use military force uh, in the short run. Now, I'm not saying that those views ended up, you know, necessarily putting pressure on uh, Xi Jinping, but they may be reflective of uh, ongoing discussions uh, taking place inside uh, of the CCP at higher levels. Um, you know, but I, I don't have any particular insight into you know, who exactly uh, is contesting on what issues at this level um, of specificity. I do think that particularly on you know, economic issues um, where there are much more readily identifiable interests and um, material interests, as well as when you think about, for example, the sprawling uh, BRI, where there are many, many different actors involved uh, in implementing as well as agitating for uh, changes in policy. There is much easier to discern, you know, different actors, um, where even if they are not playing, uh, you know, a key role in, you know, rolling out the slogans, nonetheless, in the implementation phases, do have a key role uh, to play in how policy uh, turns out. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, the first question I pick is from William Knight in London. China certainly seems to be aiming to become an active member of international institutions. Is the objective predominantly to mold such organizations into adopting China's own governance standards and thinking, or is it being too cynical? Well, I think that it's not an either or, um, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be idealistic here. In fact, I think it's very important to be realistic about what it is that China is trying to do. But we have to also recognize, and part of the um, sort of, I think part of the payoff of the framework is recognizing that China doesn't have one single set of governance standards. In fact, it has many different uh, issues. And so its behavior towards certain international organizations will look different than others. And so in some areas, such as you know, thinking about human rights, universal values. Yes, there's a definitely an attempt to, uh, you know, move those norms and standards away from the sort of the, the sort of post Cold War liberal interventionist mold toward one that is you know much more uh, deferential to the host states, uh, in particular the government's uh, interests and wishes. But on other issues, uh, you know, whether it's you know the IMF or you know, the World Health Organization, what, what does it mean for, you know, what are China's own governance standards there? I think there's a lot more sort of give and take uh, as to, um, you know, whether or not China is in some ways sympathetic with some standards, but of course we have the, the difference there, the gap there, I think is a lot smaller. And so this is, it's different from, you know, trying to, trying to recreate, I think, other institutions in China's own image. Again, the intensity of China's preferences, I think we again have to go back to the domestic uh, centrality of a particular issue set. And on issues that are quite central, that ones that threaten the very survival of the CCP, particularly the emphasis on you know, universal values and individual political rights, you know, that's an issue on which the CCP feels intensely and is working hard to change. Whereas other ones where there's more domestic contestation inside China, where it's not as central uh, to the CCP's legitimacy, or where there's even a shared interest, um, then you know I don't think that we need to think about it as to dominate these institutions and um, you know replace existing norms with China's own. Next question comes from Bill Hayden of the Chatham House in London. Can you suggest any example of the Chinese Communist Party demoting an issue from higher to lower centrality? Is it possible for it to downplay an issue by managing public opinion? So somebody asked actually here about you know, China's um, border dispute with India. And I think that's an interesting example of an issue where of course sort of its latent centrality is quite high. Anything that has to do with territorial sovereignty is quite high. But I think tactically, the Chinese government has made a decision not to, uh, you know, hype the issue uh, in public uh, discourse. It's, you know, not reported, you know, much of the Indian activity along the border. And so that's an example, and that's, you know, consistent with 
how China has behaved in you know some of its territorial disputes or various times tried to to downplay certain issues. Um, so when, for example, you know Vietnam, um, there were you know mass some you know anti-China protests, uh, you know over contending uh, claims in the South China Sea. You know China did not uh, allow you know, reciprocal anti-Vietnamese protests and relative to the dispute with the Philippines, uh, you know, Vietnamese, uh, you know, that that dispute uh, was given much lower profile uh, in the Chinese media. So even on issues that there is kind of a high degree of latent centrality, we do see, I think, the Chinese government uh, demoting uh, some of these issues um, and for various reasons. And so, you know, you know, drawing upon the work that I you know, did for my first book, sometimes, you know, economic ties, especially throughout, uh, you know, for example, the 1990s, you know, China was much more interested in, you know, fostering kind of a conducive, uh, you know, external international environment, um, and, you know, downplayed uh, certain territorial disputes, and, and kind of kept a lid on um, grassroots mobilization. So we do see, I think, malleability even in this uh, area. Next question comes from uh, Alana Tang. You mentioned that China has not used force since the Vietnam incident of 1979. And yet just recently, there are border incidents between China and India where forces were actually used. China similarly has established new foreign military bases, clearly expanding and exposing its hard power more dramatically. How do you circle, reconcile this with your claim? So to be clear, uh, you know, my claim was that the Chinese government has been able to resist, you know, many of the most hawkish voices that it faces, you know, from online netizens or hawkish, you know, military affiliated uh, scholars or retired uh, generals. Not that the Chinese government has not been willing to use, you know, military or you know paramilitary force. Uh, and, and the, but so this is these are these are different claims. And I, it is important to note that China has largely, with the exception of the recent you know kind of border clashes in the Himalayas, largely kept uh, you know the defense of its territorial claims below the threshold of. A sort of outright open military force. It is, you know, you know it's often termed sort of gray zone coercion, where it is clearly uh, you know, efforts by the state uh, to advance its interests and shore up its military presence um, or civilian presence, or it's like repair military presence, um, but nonetheless um, has done so in a way that it tries to uh, and has largely successfully avoided, uh, you know, provoking an all out military confrontation. And so I, I say that largely to underscore the importance of looking at how it is that the Chinese government has managed and in some ways uh, accommodated or pacified, appeased, I guess you would say, appeased these domestically hawkish or nationalistic voices um, often through a few different means. One is what through what I've called bluster, right, which is a lot of tough, emotionally resonant uh, rhetoric, but that nonetheless leaves the government with substantial leeway, uh, not to de-escalate, but to, you know, postpone any final reckoning, as well as, uh, you know, direct attention to the sort of longer term ways in which uh, the Chinese government is planning to, you know, defend Chinese interests, while resisting kind of the short term pressure to take rash action. Next question from Freddie Bainbridge. How would you locate Xinjiang within China's and uh, China's foreign and domestic policy framework? Foreign because of its importance to the BLI, or domestic because of its domestic development, state building, and the ongoing crackdown of the Uyghur minorities in the region? Where would you put it? Mm. So, like most issues, uh, there isn't a clean line between domestic and foreign. Most, many domestic issues have an international component. And even if you know, the Chinese government would see Xinjiang as a purely domestic issue, uh, nonetheless, there, uh, it has 
as you know, a connection to China's international uh, objectives, whether that's in terms of security or uh, economic ties. Now, ultimately, I think the Chinese government sees this largely through the lens of domestic stability. I don't see very much evidence that international uh, kind of considerations of, you know, whether it's sanctions or uh, you know, supply chain concerns, I don't see very much uh, evidence that, you know, foreign censure or criticism, uh, that blowback is having a whole lot of impact on ultimately the CCP's, in my view, misguided, but nonetheless, what they see is their effort to to shore up control uh, in this in this region. Okay, next questions come from Dan Wang. What do you think overall is China's own perceptions towards China's role in the international system? In particular, underlines that it's not just about the rhetorics of what Chinese leaders have to say, but how China actually perceives its own role. Well, there is, of course, no singular China. And so I think this question ultimately has to be, you know, what is Xi Jinping's view uh, of, of China's role? Um, because I think there are indeed a lot of different views on what role, you know, China ought to play. Some aspire to, you know, a Chinese kind of international hegemony. Others, I think, are much more willing to see China playing a shared leadership role in a system that is, of course, much more receptive and um, you know, respectful of, you know, the CCP's continued uh, leadership uh, at home and in the international system. Uh, and others, uh, you know, would like to see China be, you know, a much more liberal state itself uh, and a much more rules, much more bound by uh, rules and much more, you know, open uh, and less dominated um, by the party state. So it is, I think, you know, any definitive even answer that I could give you now, I think, is also subject to change. And we've seen, I think, although there is this spectrum of opinion, I do think that right now the equilibrium as you know, potentially changing as it is, really does, and it's reflected, I think, in kind of this, the, the rhetoric, really, because there's, you know, you see on the one hand, an increased willingness by leaders like Xi Jinping to, to talk about the example China can provide for the world, but nonetheless to continue to reassure outsiders that China does not seek to export or its model or force others to copy it. There is a continued emphasis um, on at the international level on this you know, diversity of different systems. Um, and that is, I think, important because it is could change and is a, and would be a, a leading sign, I think, of uh, you know, a Chinese decision to dispense with that kind of restraint and to, um, you know, embrace a much more kind of universalizing uh, mission. And so ultimately, I think that there is, although there is this, you know, different spectrum of opinion, I think that there is a, still a willingness to, you know, accept at the international level, a shared leadership role. I don't think that there is a sense in which it is practical in any kind of near or medium uh, term for for China to to you know supplant uh, U.S. kind of leadership, although of course under over the last four years that became you know much more realistic given the enormous vacuum uh, that was left. But nonetheless, I think this more multipolar system again that's a word that a, a phrase that has been you know part of Chinese rhetoric for a very long time. I think that is coming a lot closer to being kind of a reality. Um, where you know in the region you know China exercises outsize weight um, and globally you know it, it is a much more shared uh, leadership role. Next question from Adam Said, Oxford Brookes University. On the high centrality issue of Taiwan, would it be possible for the international community to move Beijing's positions at all? I think it would be very difficult for the outside community to move how it is that China sees an issue as being central or peripheral. I think that there are, of course, policy actions that outside actors take will resonate inside uh, China and, and could affect you know, the actions that Beijing takes. So when you ask, is it possible to move Beijing's position on this, 
no, not on the fundamentals, but tactically, of course, uh, actions matter. And I, so I think that, you know, for example, there is a, I think a lively discussion in the United States over whether or not, you know, a position. You are frozen. You are frozen, Jessica. You are frozen, Jessica. Jessica, can and you hear Twitter. me? Uh, Sorry, you were, you, were, you, were, you were frozen earlier. Yes, I see that now. Sorry. Yes. Well, don't worry about it. I think we got the gist of your okay. answer there anyway. Um, the, next, the next question comes from our um, Facebook feed. It's a rather long question, so if you could uh, bear with me while I read that out. And it comes from PJ Limd. A source alumni. Assertive Chinese foreign policy, such as territorial claims in South China Sea, alongside the confrontational public rhetoric employed in the wolf, wolf, wolf warrior diplomacy, tends to alienate both foreign governments and foreign public opinion. Why then does the CCP leadership continue to follow such a course of action. I think, I mean, there are more details, but if you could address that. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, um, I think that it reveals that right now, I think a couple of things. One, internationally, that, you know, China would rather be, uh, you know, feared than loved. Right? There's not, but not been a lot of, of course, correction in terms of the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. And secondly, that uh, you know, domestically, there are a lot of factors continuing to um, you know, perpetuate a desire to shore up you know, domestic security and the image that the CCP has vis-a-vis -vis alternative uh, forms of governance. And that this continued effort to uh, kind of chide others for their failings um, is a a couple of things that is, you know, aimed at reassuring, you know, Chinese audiences that there's nothing better out there, better stick with the CCP. And secondly, that um, there is in this, you know, CCP that's you know, been dominated by Xi Jinping, you know, a desire to play this more uh, combative, uh, you know, public role in, in gaining the sort of public opinion guiding and shaping public opinion is sort of struggle. And so lower level uh, diplomats in, in China, you know, take their cues uh, from this. And so, you know, again, it, it is a very offensive way to achieve a defensive objective of, uh, you know, making the Chinese system of governance, you know, look relatively appealing. Um. Next question I pick comes from Graham Hutchings, who is an associate at the Oxford China Center and also an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham. Does your framework assume that the interests and behavior of the CCP and its leaders are coterminous with those of the Chinese people or the Chinese nation? Can you distinguish between the two? analytically or conceptually, or in terms of the, in quotation marks, national welfare? Mm, a great question, and absolutely not. In fact, part of the framework rests upon the idea that all of these ideas and the presentation of Chinese interests are domestically contested. Um, and in particular, but, but there is also the, you know, unfortunate reality that many voices that would contest the CCP's portrayal of certain interests, national interests, um, are you know, silenced or marginalized. And so it then becomes, in some ways, the extent of observed contestation reflects the CCP's kind of use of repression, um, propaganda, and persuasion. 
So it is, um, it does not make that assumption, but it also recognizes that, you know, some of the most, um, you know, vociferous forms of contestation uh, are like literally being silenced uh, in, in, for example, in Xinjiang. Okay. Um, next question comes from Kinling Lo. What do you think are the most immediate domestic issues that China is dealing with, which will be reflected in China's foreign policies in the very near future? There's so many. I mean, I don't think it, there's, uh, you, you know, there's almost too, too many to count. I mean, I think pretty much everything that China does domestically has an international dimension um, these days. There is certainly, you know, it is not just domestic effects international, but the international effects domestic. And so, for example, the idea of dual circulation and I think the CCP's recognition that the international, you know, trend toward you know, some form of decoupling or, you know, national resilience and key strategic industries has led the Chinese government to similarly take measures to strengthen domestic innovation and reduce, you know, potentially catastrophic reliance on inputs uh, to Chinese, um, you know, growth uh, in industry. So, you know, but then, you know, on the other hand, you know, I think there are a lot of, when you look from the domestic outward, for example, at, you know, China's, you know, recent pledge um, on carbon neutrality, um, I think climate ultimately is an issue that China sees is stemming from its domestic interest, not only in having, you know, clean air to breathe, but also, uh, you know, a commanding position in the next generation, you know, renewable technologies and in that marketplace. So there, that's an area in which I think it's important to start with the domestic. Next question from Lucy Died, who is a civil servant for the British government. Will increased international pressure help improve the human rights situation in Xinjiang or will it backfire? No, unfortunately, I think that this is an area in which it is more likely to backfire, but there are different ways in which one might try to get creative about uh, trying to alleviate the suffering of those inside China, such as, you know, improving opportunities for those impressed inside China to seek asylum or, or refuge outside. Of course, that's, we're seeing that unfold in both the UK and, and under the Biden administration here. Um, so there, I think there's a, you have to, it depends on whether or not the policies seem to be ones that, you know, are really directed against, um, you know, a very targeted set of policies or are, you know, bluntly seen at delegitimizing, you know, the entire CCP apparatus um, or are more specific. Unfortunately, the, I think the sad reality is that, you know, the more specific the sanctions, you know, it's not like they're, those become more effective as a result. So it's a really, it's a really tough place to be. Can I actually follow up on that, Jessica, because it happens that today in the UK we have an opinion, legal opinion being offered by a very senior lawyer in London who says that there is a very strong case for what happens in Xinjiang to be considered as meeting the UN's de definition of genocide. And if, we, if that is something that will be uh, accepted more generally as a view, what is the implication of how we are engaging or how we should be engaging with China if we accept quite simply that taking on human rights in a place where it could potentially be a genocide situation and back off because it will simply backfire on the country that is responsible for such activities? I wish I had an easy uh, solution here. I think it's, it's a very, very tricky case um, because it is unlikely 
you know, given, uh, you know, China's position that, you know, a legal avenue uh, will bear fruit. So this is really about the court of public opinion, international public opinion, as well as Chinese public opinion. Um, and whether or not, um, you know, a greater confrontation uh, in the sense of whether it's an Olympic boycott or uh, other, other measures uh, to punish China uh, collectively for what the CCP, the, you know, the heinous things that the CCP is doing in Xinjiang, whether or not they are found to be, you know, meeting a legal definition of genocide. Nonetheless, a collective effort uh, to, to punish China, I think, has the real potential uh, of backfiring. But on the other hand, it's, you know, it's, it's possible, uh, you know, that it, it could, if the CCP, you know, I think it also depends on what's the out, what's the off ramp, right? Which is, I think right now, unfortunately, I don't think China sees, and the CCP does not see a lot of um, interest in, in China taking a greater uh, leadership role in the international stage. So I think there there's probably a fair amount of skepticism that even moderating uh, Chinese behavior uh, would uh, kind of gain kind of international support and, and lead to a bunch of good things um, from China's perspective. So um, it's possible that if embedded in a larger framework um, that it could work, but I, I'm afraid that it, it might not. Next question I pick comes from India. Um, it comes from Bahamd Shuba who is at the Hyderabad University in India. How do you see the PRC appointing United Front Work Department veterans serving in the minority areas as chief diplomats in South Asian and African countries? Do you see their experience in minority areas as being helpful to China's interaction with countries in South, Af South Asia and Africa? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, and I think it ultimately is one that I'd want to explore empirically, um, you know, rather than, you know, make assumptions about uh, what these, but because I, I don't, I could only speculate. I wouldn't have anything uh, really informed uh, to say on that. Right. Um, next question I pick comes from Italy. Um, is a um, academic in Italy who prefers to stay anonymous. I was wondering whether you would link the malleability of Chinese nationalism as a constraint to the recognized ability of the regime to adapt. Could you clarify that? I don't. I didn't quite follow. Well, I was wondering whether you would link the malleability of Chinese nationalism as a constraint to the recognizability of the regimes to adapt. Hmm. I, so I I do think that, as I said, that the nationalism is a strategic choice, an investment that the Chinese government has made, uh, and it is one that should, you know, the CCP wish to signal a more reassuring. Uh, attitude, they could change what is taught in schools, uh, what is taught in history books. Now, I think it is interesting, and um, I was, you know, in full transparency, I have a review essay coming out in Foreign Affairs on Ron Arminger's new book, um, where, you know, the CCP has increasingly portrayed China as present at the creation of the post-war international order. You know, of course, that's not quite accurate because it was Chiang Kai-shek and, and not Mao Zedong uh, who was there uh, you know, at Cairo. But nonetheless, this change in how the CCP portrays uh, China's role in the you know, post-war history is an important, I think, sign that the CCP would like to play a more uh, sort of constructive role or be seen as a legitimate co-founder of the existing international order. And you know, so far, of course, that's not how they are being treated. Uh, and I think that that actually potentially creates an opportunity for those you know, powers 
liberal democracies that want China to change its behavior and push back against its most problematic exercises of uh, international influence. I think particularly the sort of intrusion into uh, you know, the affairs of liberal democracy, the sovereign affairs, uh, including the sort of export of, of censorship and intimidation of diasporic communities. You know, those are areas that, I, as I said, I think during my talk that are inconsistent uh, with China's commitments to upholding, you know, non-interference. And so if China wishes to play a, you know, more constructive role in defending what it has now portrayed as its role in co-founding the existing international order, then, you know, foreign capitals and governments may be able to use that desire uh, to, you know, press for these changes uh, in China's behavior. Next question, also on nationalism, comes from Philip Mead. If Chinese you are becoming more hawkish, how will the CCP be able to manage nationalism in future? It seems to Philip that the rhetoric coming out of China in terms of the wolf warriors, the saber rattling over South China Sea, Senkaku, freedom of navigation, etc., is reinforcing extreme nationalist sentiment. Isn't the Communist Party riding a tiger that it cannot get off? Mm. It's an important question. And I think we need to be really attentive to the different strands of nationalism that the CCP is nurturing. And whether or not that's a militaristic strand or whether it's a more intolerant strand of Kind of chauvinistic nationalism that sees China as, you know, governance and society as superior uh, to others. And that's what I see it really leaning on right now. That's what that wolf warrior diplomacy is. It's this intolerant, sort of arrogant approach to viewing the troubles that other societies uh, are experiencing. Um, you know, it, I, th I would be, so that's worrisome, but it's also different from the kind of nationalism that says, you know, everybody should be ruled by China and, you know, you know, Vietnam is next, right? And I don't think that that's the kind of nationalism that we are seeing. It's not a territorially expansionist nationalism, uh, but it is a very, you know, chauvinistic uh, nationalism, one that despite the CCP's rhetoric about, you know, the beauty of a diversity of civilizations, uh, you know, is, is really you know, quite condescending uh, toward others. Next question comes from Melvin Jones. How far is the increasing nationalistic rhetoric of the Communist Party leadership related to a slowing down of China's economic growth? I think there's an important connection there. As the CCP has uh, you know, been able less and less to rely on you know, extremely rapid economic growth, they've had to change um, the sort of justifying rhetoric for the CCP's legitimacy, even away from fast growth to uh, higher quality growth, uh, as well as increasingly relying on you know, nationalism, um, while still, of course, emphasizing the importance of the economy. Nonetheless, I think that national rejuvenation, achieving nationalist objectives has come to play a relatively greater role in the centrality um, kind of the picture. Which of these different pillars does the CCP lean on? I think nationalism has begun to play a bigger role. Next question comes from a PhD student at the Ankara University in Turkey, um, Guperit Gungo. China has laid out is plans to implement a social credit system throughout the country. Do you think the social credit system will affect the contestation and centrality framework you have? Hmm. I think that if the, I don't think that the social credit system is as much as all that it has been cracked up to be. Um, nonetheless, you know, in if it succeeds in, providing the CCP with ever more insight into you know, the opinions and behaviors of its citizens, 
then it may further reduce the possibility uh, of, of contestation. But I would like to you know, see more evidence of it before we proclaim that everybody in China lives you know, um, under this kind of highly uh, integrated, um, you know, well-honed machine that sees everything and knows everything. Okay. Next question comes from Carl Diedrich. How are international criticisms of China portrayed in the Chinese media? Do these portrayals influence how citizens interact with local politicians in China? Hmm. So by and large, you know, foreign polit the Chinese media tends to emphasize, you know, the both the, the problems of political governance overseas, uh, again, to reduce the appeal of alternative political systems. Um, you are frozen again, Jessica. You are still frozen, Jessica. Particularly liberal democracy. You oh, are frozen a bit, a bit uh, Jessica. Sorry, Sorry about that. Can't get a break today. No, uh, one of those things. So in general, I'm not sure what you last heard me say, but in general, the Chinese media have portrayed foreign political systems in a negative light and jumped at every opportunity uh, to point out the hypocrisy uh, in I'm afraid you are frozen again, Jessica. You are still frozen. You know, foreign criticisms. <laughs> okay, here Sorry, we are. You were frozen again. Um, oh, no. No, since we only got uh, two minutes left, I think I'll, I'll move on to the next and okay. last question, which is also about media, but I suspect you can give a fairly short answer to that. And this comes from um, Lara Shira, a sh student at Cambridge University. She would like to ask you your opinion on the portrayal of China in the Western media. Do you think it is fair or do you see it as being biased? Mm. That's a really good and important question. There are, there is an abundance of really good reporting about China. Whether it is biased or not, I think that there is, on some issues, there are some inaccuracies or have been inaccuracies, particularly in the coverage of, we just talked about the social credit system, for example, um, where there is a tendency to uh, report or have reporting framed in a particular way. Those are headlines could be, are they all leaning in one direction? Um, and we don't see quite so much, you know, diversity of views sometimes, uh, even if in a, within a given article, there may be diversity of views, the headline leans in a particular direction. So I do think that there is, I'm not sure whether this amounts to bias, but I do think that there is a fair amount of uh, herd mentality um, where, a particular interpretation gains speed or traction. And I think uh, Ian Johnston has done a lot of work on memes um, in uh, foreign, not just reporting, but also um, you know, popular public discourse amongst think tanks and others, um, where sometimes a particular a conventional view isn't subject to quite as much empirical uh, scrutiny. And I think that the, the base, the evidentiary basis, if you will, uh, for some of the arguments is not not given as much rigorous consideration. So similarly, like the debt trap narrative, for example, I think there are some academics, uh, particularly Deborah Brodigam and Reg Meg Rithmeyer have a new piece in the Atlantic, uh, again, trying to uh, push back against this narrative, which was really rested on one port in Sri Lanka. Um, and it's particularly, I think, difficult when those narratives are taken up by uh, you know, particular governments and then shape policy because 
the underlying reality sometimes, uh, you know, the facts are lost uh, when the narratives take hold. Um, and so I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say the media are biased, but I do think that it's imper imperative for readers as well as producers of knowledge uh, in the media to, you know, to, to read uh, everything um, with a little bit more, uh, you know, recognize that when everything is pointing in one direction and we don't hear from, there are no questions asked or uncertainties allowed for, that that, that might be a red flag that we might want to take into consideration. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jessica. I'm afraid that we have run out of time and I must apologize to those of you who have raised questions that I have not been able to fit in to Jessica. And I also need to apologize to you for the um, breaking up of part of the webinar. We will look into that and hope to see if there's anything you can do about that to avoid the same problem recurring. With that, just let me thank you again, uh, Jessica, Professor Chen Wise for your fantastic presentation and very engaging conversations and discussions with our um, students and friends. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, it's been a pleasure.